Hello, and welcome to our review of ACR 2022. I'm Ed Vitale. I'm the chair of the Lupus Forum. I'm an associate professor in autoimmune connective tissue diseases and an honorary consultant rheumatologist at the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Professor Victoria Worth. She's a professor of dermatology and medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and Chief of the Division of Dermatology at Philadelphia Veterans Administration Hospital in Pennsylvania. Welcome, Vicky. Thank you, Ed. It's great to be here. Yeah, and it was great to uh, great to see you in uh, Philadelphia face to face for once, rather than uh, rather than on Zoom. Um, yeah, you know, we're going to go through a lot, some of the highlights of this. Um, and were there any particular highlights that you you had from Philadelphia this year? Well, I mean, first off, it was great to have it in my own hometown, the meeting. Yeah. And I would say the highlights for me were just the numbers of uh, lupus studies that are beginning to come to fruition or are making, uh, going to hopefully make our care of, of lupus patients easier in the future. And uh, we were desperately in need of that to happen. Um, and so I think we're going to share a number of very exciting abstracts. Uh, I would say... Um, I was uh, also interested in the fact that um, in the skin, at least, we're sort of beginning to see some of the things that you've previously described in the blood, which is that perhaps um, other cells other than PDCs are important producers of uh, type 1 interference. And so I think we have a lot to learn also, and some of that was also presented at this meeting. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, we're seeing lots of positive trials, but we're also starting to see more like granularity in the, the the way things are measured, the, the the mechanisms of action, and perhaps what some of the important differences in the mechanism of action of these drugs might might translate to in the clinic, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so that sounds like a good time for us to start on our first abstracts. And um, we first got one that was about health-related quality of life. Um, so this was uh, by Van et al., and this was about finding the impact of skin disease compared to other organ systems on health-related quality of life. So they took um, 760 patients who'd been to a single centre and they'd collected um, their disease activity, which organs were affected using um, the ULAR ACR criteria and the SLEDI data from the previous 10 years for these patients. And they broke them down into those with skin involvement and those without skin involvement. And then compared those for SF36 um, after adjusting for things like socioeconomic status, um, slick damage, fibromyalgia. Um, and these patients, uh, they were about two thirds of them Caucasian, 17% black, 10% uh, Chinese, disease duration about 20 years. And the main finding as on the slide there was that the patients who'd ever had skin disease were significantly worse on the physical aspects, physical component score of the SF36. And that was particularly in their multivariable analysis on the vitality and social function dimensions. In fact, I was a bit actually a bit surprised that the mental component scores um, were numerically, but not actually statistically significantly different. So I think this fit with what I thought is that skin disease had has quite a great impact on quality of life for lupus patients. Um, yeah, I would have expected a little bit more impact on the mental component scores. Um, and I was just interested in that some of the other studies that I've done, that I've seen of this type that try to link quality of life to other or to particular organ systems, have said other things like renal involvement or MSK. And here they particularly focused just on the skin disease, didn't they? Yeah, no, they did. Although I must say that, that from a skin perspective, I'm not sure the SF36 would be considered a skin specific quality of life measure. And so um, I would say that when you do use skin specific quality of life, it um, does look at the emotional component is uh, contributing more to poor quality of life than the physical component. So we may be also looking at the fact that we're looking at a general quality of life measure. That's a good point, because often when I give these quality of life instruments to patients in clinics or in trials they'll sort of say I, I have certainly have problems with my quality of life but these questions aren't capturing it isn't it so it's important for them them to be the right questions for the for the, the problem in hand yeah 
And that's a really good point in, in terms of the studies that we see, because um, if you're looking at skin as an outcome, then you really do want a skin specific quality of life measure. Yeah. Um, it'll yeah. tell you a lot more. Okay, so then there was there were some abstracts on bulimia map, weren't there, that that you'd looked at? Absolutely, and I would say the bulimia map um, abstract was really um, quite in, informative, uh, and essentially um, what it showed uh, was that it could pull together. Um, uh, looking at the comparative risks of infection with belimumab versus oral immunosuppressives in patients who didn't have renal lupus. And they were able to compare infectious rates with, in, with belimumab relative to three immunosuppressives, uh, namely um, azathioprine, methotrexate, and mycophenolate. And they were able to show that quite significantly belimumab had lower incidence of severe infection uh, and hospitalization, both for infection relative to these other immunosuppressives. Um, and there was no difference in the risk of injury or trauma, you know, implying that, you know, potentially this is a real finding and very important to know as we try to make choices for our patients uh, in terms of their treatment uh, with lup uh, for their lupus. Yeah. <clears throat> I, yeah, I, when I first saw this, because this was observational data where patients were having the different therapies for different reasons, and they tried to sort of adjust for those differences with like propensity matching. And my first thought was, well, is there still a bias in these data, you know, because of the, the, the different indicate confounding by indication for the choice of drug? But then when I thought about it a bit more, I thought, well, that's really consistent with what we see a lot. One thing I noticed repeatedly in the RCTs in lupus is um, lower rates of serious infections on the IMP than on the placebo in many of these trials. Uh, I, I've, I've noticed that many times. In fact, I think it might be in some of the uh, abstracts we're, present, we're discussing today. And I think it's just that being better from your lupus and lowering your steroids is more important for your infection risk than than anything these drugs do to immunosuppress you. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, way of, of putting that data together. Yeah. Um, I guess in addition, um, there was another study, um, which I guess I can uh, discuss, which uh, was uh, about bilimumab, another study about bilimumab, um, looking at the effects on the skin in patients with systemic lupus. And they basically pulled uh, the five phase three trials that are all randomized placebo-controlled clinical trials, looking at bilimumab versus um, steroid controls. And <clears throat> what this showed was uh, basically there were certain uh, aspects of skin disease that seemed to improve with bilimumab relative to placebo. And so key results were at week 52, there were more bilimumab than placebo patients experiencing improvements in a number of mucocutaneous domains. And they were looking at the, with the Selena sleet eye and with the Biolag. Um, and again, looking for differences um, between treatment groups and placebo. And you can see that um, there were differences that were seen um, with both for the four Selena sleet eye items that were vasculitis, rash, alopecia, mucosal ulcers, there were significant differences. And then there were nine bileg items. And interestingly, again, vasculitis uh, really stuck out as something that improved quite a bit. Um, and maybe not surprisingly with bilimumab relative to placebo, um, but also with the bilag, you could see some improvement with uh, other forms of uh, cutaneous eruptions uh, and um, localized uh, discoid lesions, mild alopecia, small mucosal ulcerations, and maloerythema, sub-Q nodules, and swollen fingers. So many things to think about um, that uh, were different between placebo and the treatment group. Yeah, so their previous study, they the previous analysis they'd done in the bulimumab data just said that like the skin system improved more on bulimumab than placebo. But what they've done here is they've gone into all that detail of different lesion types, which I thought was very nice here. Uh, and it, it, it seems like it's effective across most of them. Although that, do, of course, we do have quite a lot of resistant skin disease, um, even to drugs like bulimumab. And of course, we still don't, we don't particularly know why not just in terms of clinical phenotype i guess right and then also this doesn't really address the issue about rate of improvement as well which is another thing that would be um yeah. also worth looking at it um, so there's still a lot of data to understand and although these are statistically significant differences uh the percentage differences are real um but they're you know it's not like a 40 percent difference between the groups yeah. 
So oh. I think you're going to talk about uh, yet another interesting study that was presented. Yeah, so this is so we have we have three drugs licensed now in in lupus, belimumab, one of them, and here's one of the others, which is voclosporin, which is for um, lupus nephritis. So the main voclosporin Aurora study was published and led to licensing that drug, and there's been a long term extension. Um, and there's also and there are also here some some different ways of looking at the data from the original and the long term e extension study so there were there, there were there were a few abstracts on this theme and so overall uh so voxasporin being a calcineurin inhibitor is felt to be qu quite beneficial particularly in reducing proteinuria um, in patients and improving response rates which was the main finding of the of the of the original study and so uh, there was one abstract, not the one shown here, where they looked at um, numbers of patients meeting the EULAR target of less than 0.7 PCR, um, which was met on 33% of mycophenolate and 53% of patients who had both mycophenolate and voclosporin. So a quite, an, quite a large difference in that target. And I think it's important to note that only only 33 on our current standard of care of mycophenolate, only 33% hitting that target. Because voxosporin's got particular benefits on proteinuria through its direct effects on podocytes, you might expect that to be more beneficial for class five disease. And that's what's being analyzed here. Um, so they looked at the time to reaching a protein presidin ratio of less than 0.5, uh, which was for the class five patients, eight months on mycophenolate alone and 3.6 months on mycophenolate and voclosporin. And then when you took the patients who had a mixed lesion, that is a membrane or proliferative lesion, those differences were 3.7 months on mycophenolate and 18 months on mycophenolate and voclosporin. So there's some quite big differences there. Um, and I think, again, just confirming the benefits in lupus nephritis of having multiple different therapies and preferably with somewhat different mechanisms of action. There was one other third one that we noticed, again, not on this slide, but um, reporting particularly on the benefits of voclosporin in Hispanic and Latino patients. And so just like the main population, we saw proportions of patients getting down to protein creatinine ratio in, in, in the Hispanic and Latino group was quite large, so 75% on voxosporin and 65% on mycophenolate. But again, there was a bigger difference in the time it took to get to 0.5, which was 4.6 on voxosporin, 18 months on mycophenolate. So um, that, yeah, that uh, appears to be a very useful therapy. Um, one that I think in the, in the UK, we're just about to have a decision from our payers, but is being quite widely used elsewhere now. Yeah, it's very ex um, exciting to think that we're going to have some, uh, you know, good therapies potentially for renal lupus and for people that are really, um, you know, more at risk of having uh, renal problems. So this is very, very exciting news. Yeah, and I think it's, um, you know, we it, it gives you that, that a, a slightly different treatment paradigm here. Whereas in your general SLA, you, well, I think there's been a, a, most people have used agents, maybe milder agents like anti-malarials and steroids initially, and, and gradually worked up to, to newer therapies in the patients who are more resistant. But in lupus nephritis, it makes far more sense to go the other way around, actually, because you get all the damage at the beginning. And so what you want is the most effective therapy at the start, and then tapering things down perhaps to a simpler regimen for, for maintenance. And I, I think these data on speed of onset really emphasize that. Absolutely. No, it's it's uh it's going to be very good news. And early treatment, as you said, will prevent. You know, each flare is relate is uh, associated with a significant worsening of renal. Yeah, damage. even even if you even if the EGFR doesn't seem to have changed very much, you are losing nephrons every time you have lupus nephritis. So, so then we lastly we had some abstracts on the third of those licensed therapies on uh, anafrolimab that you took a look at, didn't you? 
absolutely. And so this is really an interesting abstract uh, about uh, the rapid efficacy of anafrolimab, um, looking at multiple subtypes of recalcitrant cutaneous lupus. And why this is really interesting is because all the studies have been done with systemic lupus, and we don't actually know what subtypes many of those patients had um, when their skin improved uh, in the anafrolimab phase three trials. But the, this study here, which is really just a few patients, but they had subcutaneous lupus or discoid lupus and demonstrated also rather rapid improvement that seemed to correlate very well with um, changes in the transcriptomic and cellular biomarkers. And so um, this is actually, I think, um, the beginning of really having uh, some rapid onset also approaches to treating cutaneous lupus that's been refractory to other therapies. Um, the responses were evident at one month and with more rapid effects observed in patients, again, who had um, SCLE and DLE compared to chill blains. So that it may not be across the board that it's going to work for all subtypes the same. And there is improvement, uh, meaningful improvement within a month. And then by uh, three months, there was a greater than 50% reduction in the classy activity, which we know is really meaningful uh, from a patient perspective. Uh, in all patients, there was a rapid and marked suppression of the interferon uh, score and also plasma plus the tetherin um, by one month. And so this is really um, a nice study to, and I think hopefully the beginning of studies, of, we'll look at this with CLE. Yeah, I mean, with, a, with any new therapy, but particularly with like a really different mode of action, like with anifolumab, it's really fascinating when people start reporting their own observations in the clinic to really get the, the detail on how things work. And I've I've heard many people say that, um, the efficacy they see in there, and they're really in both in really resistant patients, but also in in speed of effect is 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 very impressive in a real world setting. Yeah, yeah. So we're looking. Uh, I think again, more data will be great, and this is really the beginning. I think of a new era for us. Yeah. And there was another study that looked at long-term safety and efficacy of anafrolimab in adult patients with systemic lupus. It was a multi-center randomized double-blind placebo-controlled uh, uh, three-year tulip extension study. And this was looking, um, as we know, with how anafrolimab is working, um, but looking at the long-term safety and efficacy um, of 300 milligrams of anafrolimab versus placebo in 547 patients, so a rather large number of patients who finished one year of the TULIP 1 or 2 trial and then completed a three-year long-term extension. And so the, um, what was found here was that the rates of um, adverse events um, was actually uh, similar between anafrolimab and placebo. And then when you look at adverse events of special interest, um, if anything, there was maybe a little bit less deaths in the anafrolimab group than placebo. Um, and there were similar uh, overall between anafrolimab and placebo in terms leading to discontinuation um, or serious infections or herpes zoster. So this is actually good news uh, for, in, in that regard. Guard. Um, there were no cases of active TB or anaphylaxis. Um, the routes of malignancy were low, and or the rates of malignancy were low, and similar between groups. And patients on anaphrolimab had greater mean improvement, and their sleet I2K was continued improvement over time. So I think we're looking again at uh, not just the fact that this drug can work quickly, but that it can also be used safely. But an interesting feature of this one is that they actually kept that placebo arm going throughout the long-term extension, isn't it? Because that doesn't, that doesn't always happen. And it's always a problem if you don't have the placebo because you're gradually enriching the population for the patients who are sort of doing well, who stay in the study. But here you've got a placebo going right through it. Yeah, that's extremely unusual. And, you know, we usually think of a long-term extension study more for safety for everybody. And here we yeah. can continue to show differences in terms of uh, side effects, which is very interesting. And the other interesting aspect of this was that, uh, as it happens, this particular long-term extension study took place over the COVID pandemic. Uh, I remember having my patients in my centre in this study and uh, actually having to give them their infusions myself because all our research nurses were on COVID wards. But um, what it does mean is that we've got a bit of data on COVID on this therapy. It's not, uh, I remember it wasn't very many cases, probably because it may just be because people were shielding. Um, but the cases that there were seemed reasonably well balanced between the groups and seemed to go down a lot when the vaccinations came in. So relatively reassuring on that. Yeah. Okay, so then we have some 
that's the licensed therapies and now we're on to the investigational therapies and thankfully we've got quite a lot of those that are already in phase three some of them with positive results um and the first of those is this trial of teletasicept so this is another molecule working on the BAF system so we're all quite familiar with blocking BAF through the, the use of belimumab that's been licensed for more than 10 years now but BAF it's a somewhat more complicated system because you've got you've got BAF and April, and then you've got three receptors that they can bind to. So with belimumab, you're just blocking BAF itself, but that may allow some activity of April or th- of the membrane bound BAF to still activate some of the receptors in the BAF system. And so there've been a few, there are a few studies uh, uh, of groups that are trying to investigate molecules, trying to develop molecules that would that would block that system a little bit more thoroughly. And um, one of the approaches is that there's a one of the BAF receptors called TASI. It's it's only expressed on some of the B cells, but it's, it, it, it binds both BAF and April. So if you have a soluble fusion protein of TASI, then it'll then it, it, it may be more effective. Um, and uh, so there was one of those, a tacicept, that got to phase three trials a while ago, but unfortunately didn't succeed in those trials. And that may have something to do with more to do with the trial design than because of the drug that didn't work. Um, and this is another molecule with, with a similar concept. Um, and it looked effective. So um, there were 335 patients who were randomized to teletacicept, 160 milligrams or placebo, it was an SRI4 endpoint, just like the bulimimab studies at 12 months. And there was a, you know, a really big difference between the treatment groups. So SRI4 response being met in 83% compared to 38% um, at 12 months. So that's more than a 40% difference, which is more than you see in most lupus trials. So that seems quite positive. Um one, I mean, this this study was mainly conducted in sites in China, um, and Chinese patients often have quite quite severe lupus, I think, um, and that can that may have led to the fact that the diff, the placebo response rate gets lower, um, and the uh, and the the intervention response rate gets higher, so it may have led to a bigger delta. Um, but overall, this looked. Uh, this looked pretty exciting. And this was the one actually that I mentioned earlier that again had shown that um, although the overall infections were a bit more common on teletacicept, the serious infections were actually lower on teletacicept than on placebo. So again, the same point that we saw with the, the bulimimab observational study earlier. Yeah, but the, yeah, very, um, very interesting study. I think that uh, certainly, uh, hopefully, more to come with this. And yeah. do you know what the next uh, st- plans are with since this was a phase uh, three, right? Yeah, I, I, I don't actually, I don't actually know what the what the next plans, but I expect we'll see more about this drug. Yeah. A lot of interesting ways to manipulate the immune system, and we're going to learn a lot about lupus, I think, uh, by all these different approaches. Yeah, uh, and that sort of brings me to some of the even earlier studies, such as uh, phase two studies. There were a number of those also presented. Um, there was one that was looking at double-blind randomized placebo-controlled multicenter study, looking at lenabesum, which is a CB2 uh, agonist and uh, dampens the immune system. They were looking at pain in systemic lupus. And um, this drug has been tried in scleroderma and also dermatomyositis. And this is the first time that it was being applied in, um, in pain to look at the efficacy and safety for inflammatory musculoskeletal disease and systemic lupus. And so adults that had uh, musculoskeletal symptoms uh, with average uh, maximum daily uh, pain scores of greater than or equal to four on a 10 point NRS scale were randomized to either placebo or, or two different doses of the drug. And uh, essentially what was shown that in a covariate adjusted estimated change that there was not significant difference between the groups of placebo, the low dose and the higher dose, although there was perhaps a a little bit of a trend. And then among 84 subjects um, with uh, data at the end of the treatment period, uh, pain did seem to improve by at least one pain category from baseline for uh, 14% placebo relative to higher amounts in both low dose and medium dose as uh, well as high dose subjects. And so there seem to be some differences here, um, although again, not meeting their primary endpoint. 
and there were no grade four or five adverse events. So we certainly are always looking for ways to deal with the uh, musculoskeletal pain and lupus. I'm not sure we found one here, but it was a very important study. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's interesting to see um, studies looking at pain in particular. It was that, that end point also came out in the baricitinib studies again that were were that didn't meet all of their endpoints, but actually the pain endpoints looked quite quite good and it's it, it's it's a, perhaps a slightly surprising trend because I think we've always been thinking that you need to focus on joint swelling and you need to focus on proven synovitis because that's the only thing that improves but that's the only thing that's definitely lupus and pain might not be due to lupus it might be due to something else but you start to see studies like this where there actually are interesting signals for pain symptoms themselves um so I did yeah. feel I felt even though it didn't meet its primary endpoint, it was I felt relatively positive to see that pay, people were able to achieve that in trials. Yes. Uh, and uh, speaking of another phase two trial, um, Ducrafosidinib, um, we previously heard only just a few really months ago about the phase two trial that was quite successful for SLE and with great uh, uh, benefit both for SLE and also for skin. And so here was a study looking at uh, interferons, B-cell pathways, and serological markers of SLE in terms of the pharmacodynamic analysis uh, from this phase two successful Paisley study. And so we know that two, uh, uh, this drug is an oral selective uh, TIC2 inhibitor, and, and it has effects uh, on a number of different pathways. And so what they were able to show here is that um, after treatment uh, with the drug, um, TIC2 inhibitor, that you could get uh, reduction in interferon alpha, type 1 interferon, in the gamma interferon. Um, and some of these effects happened rather early on. The gamma interferon was by week 12. And also there was inhibition of the uh, number of genes that were uh, interferon upregulated uh, from week two through week 48. And also the effect on cytokines and chemokines downstream of interferon, including BAF, MCP2, and CXCL10. And when you actually look at the graphs here, they were there were pretty remarkable decreases seen uh, with the drug. So I think stay tuned. Uh, it will be very interesting to see how this drug progresses over time. Yeah, I heard a lot of, there was quite a bit of buzz about Ducrevacitinib, I think. Um, and uh, it's, in, it's interesting, isn't it, that the this, this cytokine signaling hasn't quite made it into lupus yet, despite many attempts. So the the, the, the trials of the JAK inhibitors that weren't successful in the end, the BTK inhibitors weren't successful in the end, but the TIC2 inhibitors seem to be the, one that, the ones that are generating the interest now. Absolutely. Because I suppose a greater selectivity for interferon means you can get more efficacy with uh, with less soft target effects. Right, and then you were you had a couple of more papers that you wanted to discuss. I think. Yeah, that's right. So there was this this there's another phase two here, which is Um, and this is again, you know, as as you say, you know, the, the mechanisms of action just keep getting more and more interesting. Um, so this one is an S one P one inhibitor. And what that does is it, it stops the lymphocytes migrating around. So it stops them getting out of lymph nodes, in other words. So usually when patients have this, you see the lymphocyte counts drop, which ha should have obvious benefits for a disease like lopus. So here, th this was quite a large phase two. It was 427 patients, and they were randomized to placebo, or they're one of four different doses of Cinerimod, 0.5, 1, 2, and 4. And then the other interesting part of this design was that they got six months on the original dose and then there was a re-randomization and then another six months of treatment and then another six months of, of follow-up after that primary endpoint change in the SLE dye um secondary endpoints SRA4 change in the biolag and um so yeah just like one of the other ones we mentioned it, it didn't meet its primary endpoint on statistical significance, but in post hoc analysis, the four milligram dose did actually look like it was fairly effective. And for that reason, this drug actually has progressed to um, phase three with that, that four milligram dose. There was also more benefits seen in the patients who had more active disease. Um, so uh, again, reason to believe that you you may get a may still get a good result with this drug, even though it's failing to meet its um primary endpoint there was another abstract at the meeting which is we haven't shown here but they did a um 
there, there was a biomarker study where they looked at gene expression and protein biomarkers associated with lupus activity, and those were also reducing with um, with uh, Ceneramod. And then, um, and then the last one of these is um, again another very interesting mechanism of action. Uh, this is Zetamipzumib. So this is the first time we've seen an immunoproteasome inhibitor. So immunoproteasome is responsible for degrading ubiquitinated proteins in immune cells. Um, and that can be involved in the presentation of proteins in MHC class one, but also um, uh, the production of inflammatory cytokines um, and antigen presentation. And so uh, zetamipsum inhibits those processes um, this is quite a small study. So it's 10 patients who have lupus nephritis um, with a primary endpoint of reduction in proteinuria. And this is just an interim analysis. It's just actually the first five patients of whom three of the five had a 50% reduction in UPCR. So really, really early data, but an interesting and very different mechanism of action and relatively promising. So things are progressing with this one as well. Yeah, another, another, we keep getting more targets, and I think we're going to learn more about which patients get which target as time goes on. It's a very exciting time. Yeah. So I think that's the end of our abstracts for this ACR. There were many more that we could have talked about, but of course, we there's never enough time for all of, all of that. Um, there are some summaries of all the abstracts that were presented uh, on the website of the Lupus Forum. Um, but it's really promising to see so many therapies in development for lupus, I think. I totally agree. Uh, so thank you, Vicky, for joining me and for sharing your thoughts on the new data from ACR. It's always so insightful to have your input. Um, and thank you, everyone, for listening. The slides we've shared at these podcasts are available at the Lupus Forum at lupus-forum.com. We update our publication library every month with the latest data, so do register on that site to be kept up to date. You can also find us on Lupus Forum, or one word, on Twitter and on LinkedIn. So thank you, and see you next time. Thank you very much.